two weeks ago, we talked about, um, the, in fact, the name of the class was Death for the Wicked. And we looked at uh, quite a few passages of Scripture which indicate that the punishment of the wicked is death and destruction. <clears throat> Spencer raised a question about the fire that is mentioned in the Bible that consumes the wicked. And so I wanted to address that. In fact, we're going to take the whole class to talk about it. So as you can see, the title for this class is The Fire That Incinerates. What does the word incinerate mean? Burn. Burn to nothing. Right. Burn until there's nothing left. Completely consumed. That's what the term uh, refers to. Now, if you remember, we looked uh, last time we looked at the uh, case of Sodom and Gomorrah, that uh, God destroyed the wicked city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and did he leave anything left? Nothing. He left nothing. Absolutely nothing left of that city. <clears throat> Now, what's fascinating about this is both Peter and Jude in the New Testament tell us that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is a precedent or an example of what's going to happen to all of the wicked eventually. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, you can jot this down if you want, uh, it says that uh, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to destruction making them an example for those who afterward would live ungodly. Now, what does that mean? Those who live ungodly have a precedent for how God is going to deal with them. Right? Isn't that what it's saying? <clears throat> now, now, Jude is even more explicit. In Jude 1.7, he says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, the, the phrase eternal fire is a term that's used elsewhere for the fate of all the wicked, right? We see that uh, plenty of times in the scripture. <coughs> and what Jude says here is that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, essentially, is what's going to happen to all the wicked. And that is, the precedent is they're going to be burned up, nothing left. Now, I want to look at this fire. Uh, Spencer raised a question about the fire and uh, the fact that it was uh, created for the devil and his angels, and therefore it must be a qual there must be a quality to this fire that burns up the wicked that is different than just the normal fire that we know about, like the fire you know that, at a barbecue grill or or it burns down a house or something like that. There has to be something more to it than that because. According to Jesus in Matthew 25, it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the devil and his angels are not physical beings. Isn't that right? They're not physical beings. They're spirit beings. <clears throat> if this fire was prepared for them, then it must have some kind of a quality that's not, that's, that goes beyond what we know of in, in fire today. Now, what we find <clears throat> throughout the Old Testament is that the fire, there, there's a special kind of fire. It's called the fire of the Lord. We see it uh, used several times in the Old Testament. I want to look at uh, one of those places. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. <coughs> Everybody there? This is the story of Elijah and his showdown with the prophets of Baal. Any of you familiar with this story? <clears throat> the false prophets, the prophets of the false god Baal. Um, many of the Jews were worshiping this false god. And so Elijah, the prophet of God, challenged them to a showdown. And the challenge was, you build an altar to your god and offer a sacrifice, and I'll build, Elijah says, I'll build an altar to the true god and prepare a sacrifice, and whichever God provides the fire for the sacrifice, that's the true God. <clears throat> so the prophets of Baal, they built their altar, and Elijah built his altar, and they got all their animals prepared, and their wood, and everything on there. And so we see the, the prophets of Baal uh, calling out to their God, right? Crying out and wailing, and, oh, Baal, answer us by fire, and they were cutting themselves and all this. And so if you, if you read, read the story, you know that Elijah began to mock them. 
He said, maybe your God is asleep. You need to cry out loud or wake him up. Or maybe he's on vacation or, you know, stuff like that. He was, he was mocking them. <clears throat> then at the end of the day, this is what happened. Let's look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. Then he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. Now this is not the way to kindle a fire, is it? Pour water all over it and all over the wood? No, not really. <laughs> so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice the way that this fire consumed. It says it fell from heaven. That is, it came down. Normally, when you start a fire, which way does the burning progress? It always burns up. Right? Fire always, you have to start it at the bottom and it works its way up because the flames and heat rises. Right? This fire did exactly the opposite of that. First of all, it says it fell from heaven and it consumed the sacrifice. That's the animal. Then it consumed the wood, which was under the sacrifice. Then it completely consumed the stones of the altar. The, that is, the entire stone altar was reduced to nothing. And then it burned up the water that was in the trench all around that had been filled. That's some kind of fire. Right? Well, it's called the fire of God, and that's because it's a unique kind of fire. Now, there's, there's several other examples in the Old Testament of the fire of God and what it does. There's one example of Aaron's sons, uh, Nadab and Abihu, who were priests, and God had told them that he wanted the, um, the way that they carried out their functions to be done a certain way. Well, they did it any way they wanted. They disregarded God's command, and it says that fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. That is, it reduced them to nothing but ashes in a matter of seconds. That's not ordinary fire. Right? That's not ordinary fire. Ordinary fire doesn't just jump out at somebody and burn them up until there's nothing there. This is some kind of a supernatural fire that God provides. Now, <clears throat> what we see throughout the Bible is that this is the fire that God says is the destiny of the wicked. Um, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> now just, just as, I, as I showed you, or as you're turning there, as we started the class, I mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, how it was completely reduced to nothing quickly. And I showed you from 2 Peter 2 and from Jude 1 that God says that this is the example of what's going to happen to the wicked. What are we doing when I do that? What's the point of me doing that? Why am I taking something from the Old Testament and then tying it in with the New Testament? Captain? Well, even the New Testament says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for God. Doesn't there have to be harmony in the Scripture? Yeah. There has to be. Harmony is the key to making sure that you've come to the right conclusion. Did I see your finger go up there somewhere? Well, you, I, the only reason I was uh, comparing it to the New Testament is because it just took that uh, saying of how the world was going to end, basically, or the wicked ones was going to be judged through the fire, the same fire. So that's how Sodom and Gomorrah tied in with the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It sets a precedent. And the New Testament says it is a precedent, right, for what's going to happen to the wicked. 
All right, I want, you, I, want, I want to show you the same kinds of things. I want to show you some passages in Isaiah and in Jeremiah about what the, what the Bible says is going to happen to the wicked. And then I'm going to show you that Jesus and John the Baptist quoted from these passages and said essentially the same thing. The problem is people look at what Jesus said and what John said, and they interpret it in a vacuum without the historical foundation of what's been said in Isaiah and Jeremiah, where they use the same language. And then they come to wrong conclusions because of that. All right? But if we define our language first through the Old Testament, and then we see what Jesus and John the Baptist said, it makes perfect sense because what they're doing is they're referring to these Old Testament passages of Scripture. So let's go to Isaiah 1. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> Isaiah 1, 18 is frequently quoted in gospel presentations. How many of you have ever heard Isaiah 1, 18 quoted when somebody's preaching the gospel? Okay, I saw a few hands go up. Yeah. What does it say? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Yes. It's a beautiful verse. But what's the co context of the passage? Well, first of all, you have to understand Isaiah was a prophet who was, throughout his book, was predicting the coming destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar because of Israel's unfaithfulness. And there's a lot in Isaiah that has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, but there's also a lot in Isaiah that has to do with the end of the age when uh, Christ returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. Even the virgin birth of Christ is in Isaiah. Right? Isaiah 53 is all about the crucifixion of Christ. So we have a wide range of uh, material topics that are covered <clears throat> in the book of Isaiah. All right, let's look at this passage now. Go back to verse 16. Um, from verse 1 all the way up to about verse 15, God is basically condemning Israel because they won't listen to him. They just won't listen. In fact, in verse 10, he says to Israel, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, is he writing to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Who's he writing to? Who's Isaiah writing to? Who's God speaking to in Isaiah 1? Verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Oh, okay. <laughs> So he's calling, he's calling Judah and Jerusalem Sodom and Gomorrah. He's calling the rulers of Judah and Jerusalem the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now why is he saying that? Well, they're pretty wicked. Not only that, he's going to burn them up. Okay? Now, he goes on and lists their crimes um, in this chapter. We're not going to read all that because i got a lot of material to get through. But look at verse 16. He gives them an opportunity to repent. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then he goes on, beginning in verse 21, to talk about Jerusalem's harlotry, the whole city of Jerusalem as a harlot. <clears throat> he continues to talk about this. By the way, in Revelation, it talks about God's judgment upon the city that is spiritually called Sodom. What is he talking about? This passage right here. He's talking about Jerusalem. And people who knew Isaiah chapter 1 would know that in that particular instance, he's talking about Jerusalem in Revelation. All right? Now, I want to skip down to um, verse, well, let's look at verse 24. <clears throat> Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. Now what does that mean? What metaphor is he using? 
He's talking about metallurgy, right? Gold was melted down and the dross or the impurities would come to the surface. Anytime you melt down a metal, that's what happens. Because different things melt at different temperatures and you can get it to a particular temperature so that you can make sure that all the impurities are alloy. Alloy means different kinds of metals that are mixed together. Because they melt at different temperatures, you can get that stuff out by, by heating them to particular temperatures. So God, what he's saying is he's going to purify Judah and Jerusalem. Right? He's going to rid them of the crud. Well, the crud are some people, as we'll see. He says, um, verse 25, I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross. I will take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. Now, what is he talking about? This is the kingdom. This is when Jerusalem is restored. Read beginning in Isaiah chapter 40 all the way through the end of the book. It's all about this. He sums it up in just a few words here. But that's what the second half of Isaiah is all about. It's all about Israel being, and Jerusalem being purified and restored and becoming the inheritance of the redeemed. All right? But now in verse 28, he begins to talk about what's going to happen to the dross. That is the stuff that God skims off the stuff that he's going to take away in order to purify uh, Ju Judah and Jerusalem. This is what he says, verse 28. <clears throat> the destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. You see that word, consume? It's the same term as used when the fire of God consumes something. That, that is, it leaves nothing left. For they shall be ashamed of the, ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired. And you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen. Now what he's talking about here is the, what Israel did was they had, they had what they called groves where they built a special little garden, like a little tiny paradise, for their uh, false gods, their idols. So they'd have their idol all set up in a nice little grove with a gazebo or whatever, you know, where they would go and worship you know, their god and, and tend that little grove. And that's what he's talking about. For you shall be as a terabith whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. What happens to a tree when it has no water, or a garden that has no water? It dies. It dies, and it turns to what? My backyard. Your backyard. <laughs> My front yard. <laughs> what does it turn to? Uh, something that's all dried out. If you put a match to it, it's just going to go whoosh, right? All right, that's what happens. So he says, verse 31, the strong shall be as tinder, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. Now, two things I want to point out in verse 31. Where it says both shall burn together, the word for burn in the Greek version of the, of the Old Testament is katakio, katakio. And it means to incinerate completely. That is to burn up and leave nothing. Secondly, I want you to notice the last clause where it says no one shall quench them. You see that? No one shall quench them. Actually, the word them is not in the text. It's in italics if you look at your, if you have a New King James Version. It literally says, and no one shall quench. And it's talking about the fire that's going to burn them up. The wicked, right? They're going to be completely consumed by the fire that no one can quench. All right? Now, this phrase, unquenchable fire, in the, in the Gospels comes right out of this passage. I want to show you what John the Baptist had to say. Uh, look at, keep your finger here, go to uh, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is John the Baptist preaching. <coughs> I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, burning up, meaning burn up completely, is what the Greek word means. 
And unquenchable fire is the same fire that we read about in Isaiah chapter 1, what God says he's going to do to the wicked, right? He's going to burn them up with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist says the same thing. And is John the, ba is John the Baptist talking about the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar? Is he? Why not? Because it's future. That happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before John the Baptist wrote this. So he's taking the terminology of Isaiah and he's applying it to all of the wicked. And Isaiah, and both, both in Isaiah and in John the Baptist, it's clear that God is going to completely consume and burn up the wicked. All right? So what my point is, just like we saw Sodom and Gomorrah, we see the New Testament saying this is the example of eternal fire or this is an example for the wicked who would come afterwards. This is what's going to happen to them, just, so, just like what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the same thing here. We see the Old Testament precedent, and we see the New Testament using that Old Testament precedent in reference to the wicked who come later. Okay, yes, Angel? Why does it say he will baptize us with fire? Well, he's talking about dividing Israel. All right, when John the Baptist came, his, his, his preaching and his sermon and also Jesus' preaching separated Israel into two camps, those who would hear God and those who would not. All right? the, the two baptisms are he's going to baptize the one group with the Holy Spirit, those who would receive God, and the other group are going to be baptized in the fire, that is, they're going to be consumed. The word baptized simply means to be immersed. People confuse it. They think it's a religious term. It's not a religious term. It simply means to be completely submerged in the fire. Yes? Oh, so being baptized with fire mm -hmm. isn't the, fire, the judgment fire. Yeah. Yeah. See, he's talking about all of Israel. God is dividing them. This, this group is going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, this, or immersed with the Holy Spirit. This group is going to be immersed with the fire, in the fire. And it's the fire that consumes and burns them up. Okay? Some people think, oh, that's talking about the day of Pentecost. No, 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 no. It's judgment. It's judgment that it's talking about. Okay? Anyway. <clears throat> now, I want you to go to Isaiah 66. And I want to show you how Jesus quotes from Isaiah directly <coughs> when talking about Gehenna or the destruction of the wicked. <clears throat> now, Isaiah 65 introduces the new heavens and the new earth and the restoration of Jerusalem. Don't think new heavens and new earth is a different planet. It's not. It's restored heavens and land. And he goes on to talk about Jerusalem being restored in the same chapter. And then he, anyway, he talks all about Jerusalem's restoration throughout the beginning of Isaiah 66. And then, well, let's just look at the end of it, verses uh, 22. He says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now this is up at Jerusalem, which he had just been talking about in the previous verses. And this is in the kingdom. Then he says, and they shall go forth. That is, after they come up to Jerusalem to worship me, when they leave Jerusalem, they are going to go forth. That is, they're going back home. They shall go forth <coughs> and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, it is corpses. That's in the fire. You see that? What is a corpse? A dead guy. Is it somebody writhing in pain and agony? They're already dead. All right. He's going to, you're going to look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. And then he says, for their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Okay, notice their fire is not quenched. Again, the same terminology that we found in Isaiah 1. The same terminology we find in John the Baptist's statements. Right? The fire is not quenched. <clears throat> Does that mean the fire will never go out, that it's going to burn continuously forever and forever and forever? No. What does it mean? What does the fire is not quenched mean, or the fire is unquenchable? That means it can consume water, so you can't 
<laughs> and you consume water. Like with Elijah. <laughs> yeah. It means it can't be put out, right? It means no one can stop it. That's what it means. It doesn't mean it will burn forever. Quench means to be put out. It cannot be put out. That is, no one can stop it from doing what it's doing. That's essentially what it means, that the fire is not quenched or cannot be quenched. Did somebody's hand go up? I thought I saw a hand. I was just going to say the Bible. You were going to say the same thing I was going to say. All right, a couple more weeks and I'm going to have you teaching the class tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, <clears throat> what's interesting about this passage is Jesus repeatedly talked about Gehenna. It's translated hell in your New Testaments. But that's an awful translation. Gehenna is the name of a place. Jesus quotes directly from this passage at least four times, okay? Uh, did you have a question? I did have a question. Yeah. Um, could this be talking about, because it says we'll go and look at the corpses. Isn't that referring to the Armageddon, the people who died about Armageddon? Because it says we'll go and look. I don't know that yeah. it ever says the yes. eternal fire we go and look at. It says that is the corpses, those who transgress against God. This is Armageddon. <coughs> okay. okay, yes. So these are just well, all the wicked are going to end up here eventually, okay? But at the beginning of the millennium, or the kingdom, the wicked are going to be destroyed and thrown into Gehenna, all right? And that's what this is describing here, all right? So these are the, these are the ones, even though the mark of the beast and all that hasn't been introduced yet in the Bible, these are the people who worship the beast and, and all that that we read about in the book of Revelation that are going to be completely destroyed and thrown into the fire. Um, at, at the time of the second coming of Christ, all right? <clears throat> but we haven't been given that information yet. That's much later in the book of uh, Revelation. But all we know here from Isaiah is that these people, what, that in the kingdom, when, when the Christ returns and he establishes worship at, in the kingdom, that when people come up to the temple to worship him, as they leave, they're going to see these bodies as they leave Jerusalem, they're going to see this place where the smoke is coming up and all these corpses are piled up and they're burning. That's what they're going to see. That's what this passage says, right? Now, what I want to show you is what Jesus said about this. Let's look at Mark chapter 9. Please. <clears throat> because he quoted directly from this passage and he applied it in a much broader way, Mark 9. Angela, than, yeah. uh, than just the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9. Uh, let's start reading in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life, enter into life maimed, rather than having two hands and go to, and it says hell in, in the New King James Version, but the Greek word is Gehenna, and it's an actual place here on earth. All right. uh, to go into Gehenna, and then notice this, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Now that is directly quoted from Isaiah 66. And then he says, where, quote, their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Again, that's a quotation out of Isaiah 66, verse 24. All right, both of those statements, their fire will not be quenched and uh, the worm does not die, uh, all that comes right out of Isaiah 66. Now look at the next verse, verse 45. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into, and again, it's Gehenna. Yeah, Spence. How does a worm not die? Worms are maggots. But I mean, in the fire, if it's consuming wicked people. Well, if you, ha if, um, if you have a picture of what the... Uh, don't look like at the time there were it was constantly smoldering but it was also maggot infested at the same time now yeah the smoke it wasn't that there was you know flames just consuming everything it was a slow slow burning this is how uh, this is what they did at Gehenna is they burned the, the garbage uh, this was much later after after Isaiah wrote but Gehenna became a place where they threw all the refuse from the city and um, Maggots, it was infested with maggots and all that. The bodies, see the bodies are rotting and burning. 
They're probably rotting first before the fire gets to them. But the point is, there's both rotting and maggots eating them, and there's fire um, consuming them. But eventually, they're going to be completely consumed. That's the point. All right. But let, anyway, let's continue. Uh, verse 46, he says, um, where, and again, he quotes Isaiah 66, 24, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to be plucked out, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into Gehenna fire, where, and he quotes it again, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you be seasoned? How will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Now, the point I want to make here is that Jesus applies the passage in Isaiah even to his hearers. Isn't that right? Even to people living in Jesus' day, he tells them that, like he starts out talking about those who offend little children, that is, you know, pervert little children, that it's better, um, he says in uh, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, you know, it's better for him to be, uh, have a millstone around his neck and so forth. Then he goes on to talk about being cast into the fire and all that. The point is, Jesus is taking, he's interpreting for us Isaiah 66. He is explaining to us the scope of Isaiah 66. Yes, it does deal with the battle of Armageddon, but it's much more than just the battle of Armageddon, because Jesus is saying that even the wicked people in his day are going to end up there in the, in the, in the very fire that Isaiah prophesied about. It can mean nothing else other than that because he's quoting directly from the passage. All right? That's the only thing it could possibly uh, refer to. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you that unquenchable fire is not fire that burns forever. And I'll prove that to you right now. Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, a little bit off subject, possibly, but uh, mm -hmm. it says, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me. Now, how can you be sure that he's actually talking about a little one and maybe not a newborn babe in Christ, as the Bible puts sometimes, a newborn believer? Um, it actually could probably apply to both. Okay. But he's talking about those who believe in me, so they, obviously they have to be old enough to believe in me. He's not talking about babies. But I'm saying it was referred he's, to as a new believer sometimes. Yeah, he probably is talking about referred to as a baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that expression is used of new believers in other places in the New Testament. Right. All right, yeah, you're probably right about that. Um, I want to show you that this fire that cannot be quenched does not burn forever. I'll prove that to you from Jeremiah chapter 17. Let's go there for just a minute. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17. Now, Jeremiah was another prophet like Isaiah, and he was prophesying the very same thing, only he's much closer to the time that it actually happened. And that is when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem. All right? <clears throat> but God warns Jerusalem uh, several times through Jeremiah. And he says in verse 24, And it shall be, if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates and so forth. Then if you go down to the end of verse 25, he says, This city shall remain forever. In other words, if you obey me and you, and you stop doing all your evil deeds and so forth, then Jerusalem is going to continue forever. But, verse 26, uh, I'm sorry, verse 27, But if you will not heed me to hollow the Sabbath day, such uh, as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, if you, won't, if you won't listen to God, if you refuse to keep his commandments, if you rebel against God, he says, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, that is Jerusalem, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now, God did that. Nebuchadnezzar came, and he destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and he burned it down. And God says, this is a fire that shall not be quenched. Is Jerusalem still burning today? It just burned it up until, there was, until it was destroyed. See, this phrase, the fire that shall not be quenched, what it means is when God determines to destroy something and to burn it up, no man can stop it. That's what he's saying. It's the fire that cannot be quenched because when God has decided to do it, 
There is no way anybody can withstand God. That's the reason it's called the fire which cannot be quenched or shall not be quenched. All right? So because Jerusalem is not still burning, and he said he was going to do this to Jerusalem, and he did it when Nebuchadnezzar came, it's clear that unquenchable fire is not fire that never goes out. It's fire that totally does its job and no one can stop it. All right? Does that make sense to you guys? All right. Now, I want to show you, <clears throat> I want to talk about Gehenna and Tophet. Gehenna is a place. It's talked about in the book of uh, uh, Joshua, when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the land and they conquered that area. It's mentioned there. It's, we know exactly where it was. It's south of Jerusalem. <coughs> But Jeremiah gives us a lot more information about, about um, Gehenna. And remember, this is the word that Jesus always used, which is translated hell, in your, in your Bible. All right? One of the greatest disservices done by Bible translators is to use the word hell, a word that has pagan mythological meaning to it, and substitute it for what Jesus actually said, which was the pl a name of a place on earth south of Jerusalem, Gehenna. All right? it, me it literally means, in Greek, Valley of Hinnom. All right? Valley of Hinnom, or Valley of the Son of Hinnom. Um, and this place is mentioned uh, many times in the Old Testament. It's always in the same place. And there's a long history of what went on there and what God has said is going to go on there uh, when he gets done with the place, all right? So <clears throat> I, want to I want to show you what the Bible says about that. Now, uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 30. We're going to read 30 through 33. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. Now, remember, when Jeremiah was written... Jeremiah prophesied against Judah and Jerusalem for the last 40 years until Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city. The very year Nebuchadnezzar came and burned down the city of Jerusalem is the year Jeremiah stopped his prophecy. He prophesied exactly, and he prophesied exactly 40 years. All right, we're told the date he started and everything in the scriptures. He prophesied 40 years, and at the end of it, Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed Jerusalem and burned it down. All right? Now, <clears throat> here's what... He says, Jeremiah is prophesying this just shortly before that happened. Verse 30. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have sent their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. That was the temple. That is, they brought pagan things into the temple. And they have built the high places of Tophet. Now I want you to underline that word Tophet. It's a very important term. You'll notice it's capitalized because it's the name of a place. It's a proper name. Um, they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. That's Gehenna in Greek. <clears throat> to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come to my heart. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, here's what happened. There was a false god named Molech. And the worship, part of the worship of Molech, they had a, uh, he was a big cow, <laughs> a big bronze cow. They had an idol made in the shape of an oven, like a big stove. And part of the worship of Molech, to, to show your devotion, your complete devotion to the god Molech, you would offer your children, or at least one of your children, to the god Molech. And to do that, they put the wood and, and so forth inside of this thing, and they got it hot in this big cow, big bronze cow, and then they tied their children on top of it, and they roasted them alive on top of this big bronze pagan idol. All right? This was the worship of Molech. The children of Israel started doing that. And they had dedicated this place, Tophet, in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to the worship of Molech, and to the sacrificing of their children and burning them in the fire to the god Molech. So that's what he's talking about. Verse 30, For the children of Israel have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come to my heart. Now notice verse 32. It's very important. 
Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. Now notice he's going to change the name to what? The valley of slaughter, right? Okay. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be for food, for the birds of heaven, and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Now this is exactly what happened when Nebuchadnezzar came. <clears throat> he destroyed the city of Jerusalem, he burned it down, and there were so many dead corpses that they piled them up in Gehenna. That's, it became, they took what was originally a place that was beautiful with groves and all this stuff where they worshipped their false gods and turned it into a giant pile of corpses. All right? That's how they disposed of the bodies. This is what God says is going to happen to this place. Now, I want you to turn over to um, Jeremiah 31. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19. <clears throat> I haven't advanced my slide, have I? There we go. Uh, verse, let's read verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen flask, and take some of the elders of the people, and some of the elders of the priests, and go to the valley of the son of Hinnom, that's Gehenna, which is by the entry of the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. And say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place, that, whatever, that whoever hears it, his ears will tingle. Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place, because they have buried, burned incense in it to other gods who neither they... Um, neither they, their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. That was the children they were sacrificing there. They have also built a, the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come to my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the ha hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give as meat to the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. I will make this city desolate and a hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because of all its plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his friend in the siege and in the desperation in which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men and go, uh, who go with you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. Thus I will do in this place, says the Lord, and, it, and to its inhabitants, and make this city like Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet because of all the houses whose roofs they have burned incense to all the hosts of heaven and poured out drink offerings to other gods. Then Jeremiah came from Tophet where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on this city and on all her towns all the doom that I have pro pronounced against it, because they have stiffened their necks, that they might not hear my words. Wow. He's going to turn their place of worship into a place to dispose of all the dead bodies. That's what he said. Right? And he did that. That's exactly what happened when Nebuchadnezzar came. Now, I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. As we get later in the book of Jeremiah, the tone changes... <clears throat> from God's judgment on Jerusalem to God restoring Jerusalem eventually. In fact, in, ver in chapter 31, this is the chapter where he talks about the new covenant that is quoted so many times in the New Testament. <clears throat> For example, um, verse Jeremiah 31, 31, 
It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. Now that passage is quoted several times in the New Testament. In fact, Paul quotes that entire thing in Hebrews chapter 8 and talks about how this new covenant was uh, put into effect with the coming of Christ. At the Last Supper, at the Passover, Jesus said, this blood, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. He's re referencing this passage. All right, so you can see how Jeremiah's prophecy now is reaching forward to the far distant future, far beyond the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar to a place when Israel is restored, when Jerusalem is restored and all that. <clears throat> but I want you to notice that in talking about Israel being restored eventually, he says in verse 38 of this very same chapter, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Haniel to the corner gate. And this is Jerusalem. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill Gareb. Then it shall turn towards um, Goath. And the whole, now notice this, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down anymore forever. You see what he's talking about? Even Gehenna itself is eventually going to be purified and become holy to the Lord. This is the place that Jesus constantly said the wicked are going to be burned up in. You see that? Now, how can the wicked continue to burn forever and ever in Gehenna if Gehenna is a place here on earth, which it is, and if Jeremiah's prophecy of the far distant future says that eventually even this place is going to be restored and become holy to the Lord as part of the outskirts of Jerusalem where the saints dwell. That's what he's talking about. Yes? Um, the lake of fire that happens after the thousand years is going to be something different then? Is it? I mean, would it be Gehenna? What do you think? It seems like it would be. Why? Well, because there's a destruction that it with when he comes, mm -hmm. and then a thousand years of peace, and then there's a little rebellion, right? Yeah. Those because people, what happens to those people at the end of the thousand years? They according to Revelation 20. Run into the lake of fire with the no, it says the fire of God fell upon them and consumed them. Oh. Yes, that's the, the Gog and Magog battle in Revelation chapter 20 at the right. end of the kingdom. Yes, yeah, There's the lake of fire at the beginning of the millennium right. where the beast and fall prophets right. thrown in at the beginning and then Satan's then thrown in at the end mm -hmm. it's as it well. the same lake of fire? I think so. Really? Because it talks about the beast and the false prophet at the battle of Armageddon being thrown in there, which seems to correspond exactly with what Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 66 about the wicked being thrown there and then be, being visible from Jerusalem. The battle is going to be right there around Jerusalem. So I think it's the same place. I don't see any reason to think it's different. Well, let me tell you why. another reason why I think it's the same place. Jesus, whenever he talked about the fate of the wicked, it was always Gehenna. Always, always Gehenna. Gehenna is a place. And he, like I said, I showed you, he's quoting from the Old Testament passages. right? Now, if we get to the book of Revelation, which was written about A.D. 96, which is, what, several decades after Jesus spoke and ascended back to heaven. That's the only place we have in the entire Bible that talks about, quote, the lake of fire. Now, are we to assume that all the Old Testament people, all Christians that live, or people who lived during Jesus' day, all Christians who lived, the Apostle Paul, who died around uh, 66 AD, Peter, who died in 67, all the other apostles, they all died long before John wrote Revelation. John was the last one to die that they didn't know anything about the lake of fire. 
Because it's not mentioned anywhere else in the scripture by that phrase. That's what we would have to assume if it's a different place. That the book of Revelation, decades and decades after the rest of the apostles are dead, is now introducing a new concept that's entirely different than anything else that was talked about in the prophets or by Jesus and John the Baptist or Paul or the other apostles. See? I can't buy that. I, I don't buy that. It's the same place, in my opinion. Yeah. It seems to me, and maybe you can shed light, the line is blurry in these passages between the, corp the people who go into Gehenna as part of their, their first original death and the people who are thrown in it after as part of the second death. Well, no, it's, it's no different. The only difference, well, the only difference is, if you remember, the, <coughs> the dead, <coughs> at the end of the millennium, the dead are raised to stand before God and be judged, which means they're brought back in a physical form to be judged by God, and then they're thrown as a physical person into the lake of fire. Which but there are those who go to Gehenna as part of their first natural death. Yeah, yeah. But well, see, the, the point is, the fate of the wicked is the same. When Jesus returns, he's going to judge those who have taken the mark of the beast, and he's going to judge the beast and all that. He's going to throw them into the lake of fire. They've been judged. Their, their judgment is done. They're not going to be raised again at the end. They're, <coughs> they're, they were the living. They were the ones thrown in the lake of fire, the wicked living. At the end of the millennium, it says the dead, that is those who had died prior to that, are, stand, are raised to stand before God. So those who had not been judged at the first coming of, well, I should say the second coming of Christ, <coughs> they then afterwards are going to be raised from the dead physically to stand before God, and then they also are going to be thrown into but the lake. But some people will be thrown at twice. No. The folks who were originally part of the burning, the children who were offered to Molech, and then if they were raised again at the Great White Throne Judgment. Oh, you mean when Nebuchadnezzar? Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Death. Yeah, in that case, yes. But see, that in that case, it was not um, the final judgment. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, or it was not their final judgment. That was the Babylonian fire. What's that? That was... That was that yeah, that, right. Just like, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the people, the people who were killed uh, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Peter says that this was an example, and Jude says that this was um, a, a, a example of eternal fire and all that. Um, those people are going to be raised from the dead, and they're going to stand before God and be judged and thrown into the lake of fire a second time, or into the lake of fire then, right? They're going to be burned up twice, Okay. <clears throat> but the point, the point that's critical to all this, in my opinion, is that Jesus is using the terminology from the Old Testament prophets. When he talks about Gehenna, when he talks about the fate of the wicked, and this terminology that's in the prophets is all about the wicked being completely consumed and burned up, incinerated by the fire, that their corpses are going to be piled in there. They're going to be killed, and their corpses are going to be piled in there and be completely burned up eventually. Okay, that's, uh, that's the point that I think is, is critical. Now, I want to show you something from, um, this is a, a fascinating verse. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. <clears throat> he talks about Tophet here again, and, it's, and how that God had prepared it a long time ago for this purpose. <clears throat> verse 33. For Tophet was established of old. That is, from ancient times. Now, this is when Isaiah is writing, which was long before all this stuff took place with Nebuchadnezzar. But Isaiah is saying, Tophet was established a long time ago. Yes, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. This is a prophecy of what the eventual outcome is going to be for this place, how God is going to use this place to destroy. The king here is probably the Antichrist that he's talking about, <coughs> uh, who's going to be uh, burned up and destroyed there. Um, now, I want to show you, um, let's see here. I already showed you that Gehenna is going to be restored. Let's look, at, um, let's look at Matthew chapter 10. We have a couple more minutes left. <clears throat> let's look at something else Jesus said in Matthew 10 about Gehenna. Well, verse 28. <clears throat> you probably all are familiar with this verse. 
because we, we talked about it when we were talking about whether people have ghosts or not. <clears throat> Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. It's the same word again, Gehenna. All right, now, I want you to notice there's a comparison drawn to those who can only kill the body and the one who can go beyond just killing the body, but he can kill body and soul, right? Not only that, he uses the word destroy. Isn't that right? He can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Now, Jews listening to Jesus speak and knowing these prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, knowing where Gehenna is, they could, have, they could have left where they were talking and walked down to Gehenna at that very moment. <laughs> it was being used at that time as a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem to the south. You could have walked down there. When Jesus named that place, they knew where he meant. They didn't think of some cavern in the center of the earth, you know, with a, a devil with a pitchfork and uh, people writhing in agony forever and forever. They didn't think of that when he used the word Gehenna. They interpreted these, these terms based on what the Old Testament prophets said and what the history of that place was. And how God had said he's going to turn it into this place of slaughter and, and, and all that. Right? That's, that's their frame of reference <clears throat> for this. But, but when he says destroy both body and soul, he doesn't leave any room for people remaining alive forever and forever and forever in torment. Isn't that right? He doesn't leave any room for that. Because to destroy body and soul doesn't leave anything else. <laughs> Okay? It leaves nothing else. Some people get hung up on body and soul. They think, oh, that's showing that you know, man has a body and he has a soul. These are two completely distinct things. That's not what he's talking about. Oh, actually, in case somebody was wondering that, I'll show you why that's not what he's talking about. Look at Matthew 5. Just back a few verses. <clears throat> um, verse... Actually, before we do that, I need five more minutes, okay? Can I have five more minutes? Yes. All right. I want you to go to uh, Isaiah chapter 10. And I want to show you the precedent for this kind of language about body and soul. And then we'll see how Jesus used it elsewhere. All right? <clears throat> Isaiah 10. <clears throat> um verse 16. And we'll read 16 through 25. All right. <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning, like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a flame, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. And it will consume, and I want you to notice that, that it's in one day. And it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful fields. And I want you to notice it's both body and soul. See that? Both body and soul. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. And the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write on them. That is, a kid could go out and mark every one of them. <laughs> There's not going to be anything left, hardly. All right. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them shall return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Now, this fire, he talks about it metaphorically as burning up the forest. <clears throat> but a forest doesn't have body and soul, right? So he's clearly using it as a metaphor. He's talking about the wicked, both body and soul, right? <clears throat> now, he says it's going to burn them up in one day. In verse, um, um, where was that? 
Where was it, Spence? 17. 17. Yeah, it'll burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of the forest and of his fruitful field, both body and soul. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. So when Jesus talks about, now notice he uses body and soul in the context of a fire burning up body and soul, right? That's what he uses it for. Jesus is basically using the same language. When he says, don't fear the one who can kill the body, Fear the one who will destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Again, with this kind of background, the only interpretation that the people listening would have is that he's talking about burning it up totally until there's nothing left. Okay? Now, I want you to look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 for just a minute. And I want to show you how Jesus used these words body and soul in another place. <clears throat> Um, uh, let's see here. What is it? It's where it's where he said, "Don't worry about what you're going to eat, or what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear." It's in chapter six, right? What's that? Somebody find it. It's either in five or six. I think it's in six. I thought you were talking about where it said, "Cast your whole body into hell." No. Was that somebody said that? I can't hear you. 625. 625, thank you. Oh, okay, I'm on the wrong page. Thank you for that. <clears throat> okay, look at this verse. This is interesting. He says in verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not the life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Again, this is one of those places where the translators have done you a disservice. Just like when they translate Gehenna as hell, they're doing you a disservice by translating the Greek word suke, which is soul everywhere else, as life here. It's literally soul. It's the word for soul. He says, I, I say to you, do not worry about your soul, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not the soul, is literally what it says, more than food, and the body more than clothing. Now, I want you to notice he's contrasting the soul and the body, right? Just like he did when he talked about, don't worry about those who kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. He's using exactly the same terminology. Now, he says, don't worry about what you're going, to, don't worry about your soul, what you're going to eat. Now, wait a minute. If your soul is a ghost, are you worrying about ghost food? No. Why does he use the word soul here? And why does he say, don't worry about your soul, what you're going to eat, or your body, what you're going to wear? What's the difference between soul and body? And what's the difference between eating and clothing? I'm getting blanks at theirs. All right. Soul. I'll answer. I'll answer. Make it short. This is going over time. Eating has to do with sustaining your life. What you wear has nothing to do with sustaining your life. It just has to do with your outward appearance. Right? So, when he's talking about sustaining your life, and notice it's your physical life that he's talking about. When he uses the word soul, he's talking about your physical life. Isn't that right? Is it, doesn't your food, does your food sustain your ghost? No. Your food sustains your life as a living creature. Without food, you will no longer exist as a living being. Isn't that right? Without clothing, you'll still exist as a living being. You'll just be running around naked. Okay? Isn't that right? So when Jesus is contrasting these terms, he's talking about your, life, your, your uh, physical life, your, your being alive, as opposed to just what's inconsequential with regard to your body. All right? So when he talks in, in, um, in Matthew, in the other passage in Matthew, about don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Be afraid of the one who will destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. What's he, what's he saying? Go ahead, Spence. Isn't this the same word that the Holy Spirit? No, that's, that's Numa. The, the, Holy, the spirit is pneuma, the uh, soul is suke. 
with to totally different words. Okay. Did Does you have a question? Does soul have a, a body component? Is it body plus spirit equals soul? Yeah. Yeah. See, soul. But see, soul is more than just the body because when God created Adam, He formed a body out of the dust of the ground. But then he breathed his breath into him, and he became a living soul. So soul there includes the body, but it's more than just the body. Because it's a living person, as opposed to... But if you remove the body from a living person that's constructed from flesh with the breath of God in it, and that flesh then becomes a living soul, do you have something left that can float away? And No, because you've, you've destroyed the person. So, so when, when Jesus is saying, look, I don't want you to be afraid of those who can kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can kill not only your body, but your body and your soul. In the context of how this, these language is used in the rest of the Bible, what he's saying is, <clears throat> don't be a, those people who can kill your body, they have no control over your existence. Right? They can't destroy you. They might kill your body, but they can't destroy you. And why is that? Because your life is in the hands of God. God is the one who breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. And God is the one, if you read Ezekiel 37, in the resurrection, is going to reconstruct our bodies and he's going to breathe his breath into us again in the resurrection and we'll become living beings again. Yes? I'm just having a hard time with this because why would someone care if, like, if, if you die and you're done, and you're mm -hmm. just asleep, and if God decides not to resurrect you, your your lights out. Why would I care if I would be resurrected again and have have it lights out again? Like it just doesn't make. Because sense. there's going to be punishment involved. It's, see, the the second death is not just instantaneous ceasing to exist. There's punishment involved. Jesus said um, that it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for this generation, that is, those who rejected him. What was his point? That there are different degrees of punishment in that involved in Gehenna and in the second death. There's different degrees of it. Some people are going to suffer a great deal of torment in their destruction, and other people are going to suffer very little, depending on... But then some people could suffer a horrible physical death, the fir their first death, mm -hmm. and then they could be good people. Maybe they were tortured and murdered, you know, horrible mm -hmm. first death, but then their second death, they didn't know Christ, they were just ignorant. That could be easier. Well, ignorance... In which well, case, their soul would have been... <coughs> their soul death was easier, and their body death was really, really bad. Well, what about those same people They didn't know the gospel, and so God tortures them forever and forever and forever in flames? See, that's a bigger problem. Because... Well, no one's, I'm not denying yeah. that God's not going to torture... Or God can't destroy a soul because it clearly says He can destroy a soul in those verses. Mm -hmm. But I just see the a distinction being made between the soul and the body, and that it's it's clearly something much worse and much more distinct to have. It is. Soul. It yeah. is much more because when because all people who are killed, let's say uh, somebody murders you, everyone is going to be raised from the dead to stand before God and face the judgment. That's not the end of the person. Death now is not the end of the person. It's a temporary suspension of their life until God raises them again from the dead and he settles their final fate. All right? <clears throat> that is not as bad as you're done, you're toast, and there's nothing left of you anymore, and, and you know God's done with you completely. That's something that's much, much worse, ceasing to exist altogether. Yes? I would say that, that correct me if I'm wrong, that and destruction of the soul is the soul is what force is the, the body that God created you with and the life force that the breath he gave you to animate that body. So if he's destroying that that if you will, the breath that he gave you, that's all of who you are, the essence of everything, your consciousness, everything that you are, is altogether destroyed completely and utterly. So that <coughs> breath that he takes when you die, when Joe says you know, he takes his breath from him. That breath he gives back to him at the re at the resurrection, that's destroyed too. I would imagine. It's all. It's well. There's nothing left of the person. Nothing left. The, the, the thing is, when a person is killed, their body <laughs> returns to the dust. Isn't that right? Right. God said to Adam, "Dust you are, to dust you shall return." But the elements of their body still exist, and in in the resurrection, he's going to take the dust from the ground 
from the elements of our very existence and put us back together again. This is, read Ezekiel 37. It's very clear. He starts out with bones. And he puts them back together again and he causes the flesh to come back on the bones and then he causes the breath to breathe into them again and they stand up on their feet. And then he says, I, I'm going to bring you into the land and fulfill the promises that I made to, to Abraham and so forth. So God is putting them back together again. The first death you could be put back together again. The second death, that's it. Carl. Is there any problem with being cremated? Um, I think it's disrespectful of the body, personally. Well, a lot of that is economic. I mean, yeah, I know. I, know. I wouldn't say it's a mortal sin or anything like that. <laughs> well, I just wonder how it's going to put you back together if you're... You have know, heard of people. Like well, you know, Carl, look, I, personally for me, I don't want to be cremated because I think we should respect the body because God's going to resurrect it. But by the same token, whether I'm cremated or not, if, you know, if the Lord tarries, I'm going to turn to dust anyway, right? So if he, if he could put Adam together from some dust and breathe into him and make a living creature out of him, uh, he's not going to have any problem with anybody who's been cremated or anybody who's been buried. He can do it. Yeah. Can I just ask one more thing? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the body plus the spirit equals the soul. So if the soul is dependent on the body, then someone who kills the body, they are killing the soul too. They're not killing it in the sense that it cannot be revived. Okay. But they are killing it temporarily. It's temporary. That's the, yeah, that's the point. But what God does is permanent. It's total destruction as opposed to breaking, breaking up the person into elements <laughs> that God is going to put back together, that's one thing. But when God destroys it all, there's nothing left to be salvaged, and, no, and nothing will ever, and that person will not exist anymore. 